During the 1970s, the state of Hawaii and the Hawaiian people experienced what many call the Hawaiian Renaissance. The culture became revived. The language, music, food, art, and many other aspects of the Hawaiian culture was revitalized, and it became cool to be Hawaiian again. The Hawaiians that traveled thousands of sea miles to reach this island chain were master seafarers. Much of the knowledge they attained through centuries of intense observation remains relevant today. They knew that our native forests, the sources of fresh water, must be protected at all costs. Sustainability was achieved by protecting the entire cycle of clean and abundant fresh water. Healthy streams, rivers, and estuaries were critical to their way of life. On many of the islands, a seldom seen ecosystem was highly valued in ancient times. Some folks on the island of Hawaii believe these ponds and the aquatic creatures that flowed into the nearby sea from them was the lower part of an ocean food chain that attracted large numbers of fish and big predators. There are few examples left. Many of these sites have been filled in and developed and are some of the most threatened ecosystems. On the western part of Maui, this Ankeoline pond sits in a lava field and is near the ocean. The salinity in these ponds vary and they contain several uncommon species. Downstream from our high native forests, these ponds often mix fresh water with ocean water. Unfortunately, the loss of our Ankeoline ponds are another indicator of freshwater diversion and coastal development. The cultivation of taro is a critical component in the Hawaiian culture. The plant itself is considered sacred. The Hawaiians, amongst all Polynesians, were the most sophisticated growers of this plant. They were able to develop dozens of unique varieties. <laughs> it's in our DNA. If we know, not the, not the myth, but if we know the belief in Haloa, our firstborn, it should be taro. And taro identifies us as Kanaka. Um, and when you see other nationalities raising taro like us, wow, it shows you that this isn't only for Kanaka, it's for everybody. And if we all follow the proper protocols, we won't have the trouble we're having today. But the problem is we're not following the protocols. In Hawaiian culture, the taro plant, or kalo, has the status of a family member. A cutting from a single plant can start a cycle of unlimited generations of taro crops. Most taro farmers prefer to plant their crops in clean, flowing water. It can take up to a year before harvest. The organic nutrients and byproducts of the taro fields would also flow into the rivers and streams and were consumed by the native freshwater species residing there. Wet taro cultivation sites were like extra kidneys. They filtered the fresh water that flowed into the mulivai or river mouths, ensuring healthy reefs, estuaries, and safe homes for baby and juvenile marine and freshwater species. The whole subject matter is not the minimum flow of water in our streams, but enough water for the taro to grow. If you have enough water for our taro to grow, the water will go into the streams and flow into the ocean down to the Muliwai. The pilikia that we have is that uh, throughout our infrastructure, our modern day infrastructure, we've created uh, flood control projects which pollute our ancient uh, Muliwai and creates problems for our resources that are on shoreline, along the shoreline. Uh, likewise with your major corporations here, that run their excess water that, that is polluted into our fish ponds. And actually that goes into the Muliwai and out into the ocean and pollutes our ocean again. So if these things can be rectified and strongly adhered to, um, which means you know people being responsible and accountable for their actions, then maybe uh, this, is, this isn't really a utopian thought. It, it's a thought that will uh, bring success to uh, actually having clean water along our shoreline or running through our streams. <laughs>